You're listening to Barbell Logic, the podcast where we talk about what it means to experience strength and how you can use simple, hard, and effective strategies in training and nutrition to improve your life. It starts with meeting you where you are right now and finding lasting solutions. Welcome to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Barbell Logic. Welcome to Beast Over Burden. I'm your host, Nikki Sims. I'm the Chief Experience Officer at Barbell Logic and a coach. With me is Andrew Jackson. He is the Chief Operating Officer and Product Manager for Barbell Logic and Turnkey Coach. And he's also a coach. Coach, coach, coach. That's what you're here for. Listen to coaches. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Happy Tuesday, everybody. We have been talking this week something kind of popped up that you saw. And I'm excited for you to explain to the audience what you saw and the conversation that it sparked. And it seemed interesting to us, I think, with our history in this company and then what we're all kind of working towards. And I think you had a really good idea of how that actually applies to what everybody here is interested in, which is muscle getting strong. So what did you see this week? Yeah, so it started out with a it was a React video, which I find always interesting because my thought of what a lot of what we're doing with coaching is that we're creating React videos. It's like one of the most mm-hmm. popular... With our type of coaching. Mm-hmm, one of the most popular categories of videos on YouTube and social media in general. So it was a guy watching a video of this guy who had a bag of gold coins. Each one was, I think, two ounce coin uh, that was like $2,000 of gold. And he was just offering it to people on the street. Yeah, it's like in Manhattan, look like big city, lots of people walking by. Yeah. And as you can imagine, somebody just handing something to you, it was about 50-50 of people who would take it and people that wouldn't. And his reaction when people didn't take it was, oh, thank you. Because that's (laughs) $2,000 he keeps. (laughs) And so then the guy, you know, goes on and shows a few examples. And and then the re- guy reacting to the video paused it. And he says, you know, what I really love about this that it got me thinking about is that when you know you have something of value, you have unshakable confidence about people saying no or rejection. And it's almost a favor to you if people don't want what you're offering. And in fact, the people that don't want what you're offering are insane. Like in this case, this person is actually walking around the street handing out $2,000 a coin and people, for whatever reason, don't want to take the coin. You know, Obviously, a stranger in New York, there's probably some instances where you wouldn't want to do that. But yeah, the message again that this guy was taking away, the, the reaction person was talking about how your mindset changes when you know that you're offering something of value and that it is insightful in terms of the direction that you are aiming or your intention with what it is that how you focus your time and your energy in that by prioritizing offering or delivering as much value as possible you are implicitly moving in a direction in which you will eventually deliver so much value or have invested in so much creation of value that you will have unshakable confidence in what you are, what you have to offer. And in this context, it was a sort of a business related context or, you know, content creation kind of contest, but it resonated with me immediately as a coach in how my mindset has shifted from starting, you know, 10 plus years ago, where I was, uh, you know, you call it imposter syndrome or insecurities, whatever you want to call it. When somebody didn't want to work with me anymore, I was like Michael Jordan. I took that personally. (laughs) You know, it was like, I took that as... We would have like triage meetings (laughs) at Barbell Logic, like... Why do you think they left? What do you think you could have done differently? Like right. it was a whole postmortem and a lot of emotions, like sad emotions at the same time. 
Yeah. And, and there was probably some truth to that. And I, and I still think there's always value in doing some sort of a, you know, evaluation of your performance. It doesn't mean that I'm performing perfectly, but it was that I was so, I had such low confidence because I wasn't certain that I was adding value or I wasn't certain of the value that I was offering. And so it was this cycle of insecurity where, and there was a flip. I don't know exactly when it happened, but it's been in probably the last two or three years. And I remember having a similar cycle in previous professions. It was somewhere around the five to seven year mark. I think I've talked about this before in another episode that where I really felt, <laughs> and I think the tipping point was- Had it all figured out. Don't have it all figured out, but there's this tipping point where I knew that I'm, I was confident enough in the value that I was delivering that if somebody left, you know, that's, that's okay with me. You know, it's as much a reduction in risk that I'm not using my time effectively. You know, it's like the person saying, no, I don't want your gold coin. I'm like, okay. okay. Maybe someone <laughs> I'll else does. I'll take my time back. <laughs> yeah, I'll take my time back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. You know, again, it sounds somewhat, potentially arrogant, but it's just a confidence. You know, I know that the coaching that I provide is valuable. And if somebody wants to work with me, that's awesome. And I love it. And I'm constantly learning and evolving. And this goes back to the, you know, presentation that I gave at the block conference where I talk about how building trust is how you add value. And that's a never ending process. So it's not that I'm complacent that I've arrived, but I know that I'm currently adding value and I will continue to add even more value over time. And I'm confident in that. And I also thought of that from the perspective of a lifter in that with strength training, what I think has happened over years of training and investing in muscle, building physical value in my body, that has translated to a confidence that has spread into other areas of my life. How does that come out? In a very trivial way, I can remember thinking at times, you know, I've done a, a heavy ass set of squats, like three by five or three by six or three by eight or a heavy deadlift and gone through, I guess you would call it voluntary hardship. Yes, you would. That... Then when I'm sitting in a meeting arguing over some spreadsheet or something when I was in the corporate world, I would just have these moments of like, you know what? This is going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make it through this. Yep. <laughs> or there would be people that in the past, I would be concerned about their opinion of me that I just didn't, you know, it's like, it, there, it's a perspective and I'm not trying to be dismissive. You know, being confident versus arrogant is always a fine line, but it was just a relief from worrying about what other people thought about me. And I don't know that I can directly translate that to just strength training, but I definitely noticed a change in my mindset when I started lifting and getting stronger. Have you noticed anything like that? I've noticed. Well, this, I had so many thoughts about this as well. One of them was when I was into CrossFit. And you know, CrossFitters and vegans, we can't help ourselves telling you that this is what you should be doing. And there are holes in CrossFit. I knew as a coach, there are injuries. I knew that it was maybe too expensive. But there was this position that I had where it was just like, I'm doing the best thing, you should do it too. And I couldn't stop talking about it. And many years later, you know, a decade plus later, now that I've been strictly strength training and I've gotten to see what strength training does for so many people, I don't feel the need to be a zealot about it because I know that if someone wants to do it, I can help them. I know other people who can help them. And if they choose to do that, that's great. But I don't feel the need to be in their face and blabbing about it or be defensive if they don't want to do it. Like, it's okay. And I feel that way about lifting now is, you know, when you're curious about it, you know where to find me. And 
that's come from many years of, you know, what we did with Barbell Logic when we figured out why are people leaving is we were learning how to provide value and meet people along the entire customer journey. And I think that's why we have more security in it now is we've developed the coaching academy because we recognized how people wanted to become coaches. That was the next thing they wanted. We recognized the need for more advanced coaches. So we created two tiers of coaches. We recognized the need for other levels of coaching, which is when we had club coaching and we have things now in the works for that. So we have so many ways of providing value that we have. And this is what I'm really passionate about and what I thought about. We've created boundaries. We keep growing. We keep creating new boundaries. And like what you were feeling when there was this want to like have an influence over what someone thinks about you. I think that also has a lot to do with boundaries. It's just like when we have clear established boundaries, we don't cross them for ourselves. And I don't feel the need to please anybody or go out of my boundary because I am clear about what I want and what I can do. And that's fine. And so that's how it came up for me and in a few different ways in that we have invested in value. This is something you've been talking about. We, as like a very client-centric company, figure out how to provide as much as we can to a client, but there are limits and we know those limits and we've decided that we're okay with those limits. And when we can't provide those things outside of our limits, that's okay. We know what we can provide. And when you want to come back, if that works for you, we will love that opportunity to work with you again. But it doesn't feel like this clingy desperation thing because we have so much in place now where we can continue providing relationships and support and education resources. So I think that helps shore up our confidence. That's how it sat in my head. I think that confidence is a very powerful enabler for acting from or in a more intentional and productive way. So another example that comes up for me is working on Turnkey Coach over the last five years. And for a long time, I felt really insecure, I guess, for the lack of a better word, about the value of the software. And so anytime I would get feedback, I was coming from a place of embarrassment, basically, or like insecurity. I was not confident in the quality of the, the software. Somewhere along the line, that switched. And now when I get feedback, I don't have the same emotional reaction. I can hear the feedback and I can kind of recognize that as an opportunity for it to get better, but I don't react to it as a, again, like it's a blow to my ego. Because when I'm in a place of insecurity and fear, I'm like fields up, knives out, trying to protect what you did, the ego. Yeah. Because, yeah, there was my identity is wrapped up in people's opinions because I don't have a good opinion that stands alone. I'm relying on other external validation to boost up my confidence. But when I have confidence from within, because I have put so much value into the product or the service, then I'm no longer dependent. My ego is not dependent on getting validation externally. I can just hear it and <laughs> decide what I want to do with it or whether or not to do anything about it. Right. I think that's an important way to distinguish between arrogance and confidence is you will listen and decide if that will inform your future. And I see the difference come up the most in PBC interviews when I'm doing the interview for a candidate who's pursuing the professional barbell certification. We can tell the difference between someone who's confident and someone who's arrogant in how they treat their clients. And we ask a question about why clients left. And I've had candidates where it's just like, you are too arrogant to learn from that. And others where they take responsibility for what is out of their control or they take responsibility for what is within their control and then they understand what wasn't in their control and they're curious about what they could do in the future around that. 
but they still have the same, you know, takeaway as I couldn't help this person anymore. And some people would be like, and, you know, go, you know, you're not doing the program, go blankety blank yourself. Or, hmm, that's interesting. That doesn't work for you. I wonder what does. <laughs> mm-hmm. And if it doesn't, that's okay too. That's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they are wrong on some spiritual level as a human being. Right. Uh, <laughs> it just might not be the right time or place or solution for them right now. Yeah. Um, and it also doesn't mean, assuming the coach or client is providing value, it doesn't mean that they're a bad coach. Right. Might not be a good fit for both people. And that's another huge shift in perspective that has been helpful. Like not every client is a good client for me. Yeah. And that's okay. Like I don't want to work with every human on the planet. I want to, <laughs> there's certain people that I'm not going to be providing value to, you know, it's a, my personality is not for everybody. <laughs> no, no, but there's a niche of people that I, work really well with and they get what they want and and recognize the value to provide and and I'm simply trying to find those people because I know it can make a huge impact I can add a ton of value to those people but not everybody so I think that it's interesting from both a coach and a lifter perspective and also just I mean it can go as far as you want with it in business or or even just noticing how people react kind of to your point I now recognize when I see people lashing out like that, that, oh, okay, they just don't have confidence. They probably don't have very much confidence in yeah. the value that they're bringing or they're insecure about what they're doing. Yeah. Or I feel it in salespeople, like salespeople who are clearly only there to sell the product in front of them. And they're so incentivized. I am a salesperson this year. I know. And listen, <laughs> <laughs> we all are. But they're so, you can feel it like in Verizon or like in some stores that you go into where it's just, they're just so desperate to make you buy something versus there's this store that you and I go into, Lalabo, which they sell perfume. We've gone in there so many times. Hold on. I don't, I don't buy perfume. Eau de Cologne. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very high end. You know, a small bottle is 230 bucks. And you can go in and sample. And we do that frequently. And it's really fun. And we have bought things. But we've never felt guilty about going in there and doing that. They always have conversations with us. The perfume master with his like fancy mustache is in the back making handcrafted scents. The like, chemistry section. Yeah. Yes. It's cool, high value. And like that is alluring. And so when you go into or when you interact with a person who's selling something that they believe or they want us to believe is high value, I notice they act that way. They don't act desperately. And I think that's a really interesting demeanor in a sales type of environment. To bring this back to the barbell perspective okay uh, yes. an interesting <laughs> drama unfolded this week without going into details my generic description of it is that there was a social media dust up if you will that was very ego driven around oh. how much weight so and so lifted on one lift versus another person and whether their technique was good or not and blah 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 blah, blah. and i'm just watching this <laughs> play out and ridiculous and it, yeah. you know social media is what it is but the thing that i observe with the clients that we have that are most sustainable in their training and get the most out of their training are the ones that recognize that they're making an investment in a pursuit of adding value to their life it's for them it's not for other people exactly yeah the weight on the bar doesn't it almost doesn't matter other than it's a tool to make things hard enough that they can get stronger or build muscle. It's a means to the end of doing those things so that they can improve the quality of their life. That aim builds confidence that they are in who they are. Yeah. In their identity and in, yeah. in what they've accomplished and, and what they can do and what they will be able to do in the future and, and the model that they present to the people around them. And it's unshakable. There's something about loading up a heavy weight 
and doing it, even when it doesn't always feel good and Mm -hmm. progressing when you can, that gives you a ton of confidence. And I think it really comes back to that, that same concept as a lifter as well. Yeah. That makes me think of being at a lifting meet and seeing everybody on their third attempt where the weights are all over the place. Right. The bar starts at one weight, it increases to another weight. And you see everybody just give it their all. And there's no value of like, this one's way better than this person because they're lifting this amount. It's all like you feel it all that it's theirs, it's their lift. And I think that's the cool thing. And of course, things, you know, the heaviest lift of the day is entertaining for another reason. But the level of emotion and sincerity on those third lifts, that is the coolest thing. I'm having such a hard time keeping a straight face right now. <laughs> what? Henry My dog. just crop dusted the heck out of me <laughs> and then immediately went outside. No. <laughs> well, he probably realized that he needed to go outside he after doing that. <laughs> hit me and, and then he just immediately went outside. It's like, I can't even take my own self anymore. Henry's my dog. He's very old. (laughs) He's been killing me. (laughs) I'm not going to take it personal. I have a lot of, I know that I add value. Unshakable. You were unshakable. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't do it to you. CrossFit was unviable. (laughs) Barbell logic is unshakable. Ooh. Ooh. (laughs) (laughs) So... What do you think the steps are to establish that feeling? I think it's being committed to the same things that I talked about with adding value as a coach. It's building trust through demonstrated ability, integrity, and benevolence, which in the coaching context, I talk about those things in how I provide feedback and programming and support to my clients. But just like I wrote in my article about trust years ago, my aha moment when I was at work trying to understand or notice when people trusted me or not, the place to start is with yourself. If you don't have integrity with yourself, if your actions aren't aligned with what you say you're going to do, if you're not building your skill set and proving to yourself that you're able to do things that you want to do, or if you don't demonstrate care for yourself, then you won't trust yourself and and people will pick up on that. They'll feel that on some level. They won't say it that way, but there will just be that feeling there. They won't trust you on some level, sub some conscious level. So invest in things, invest and prioritize actions to build trust with yourself. Do what you say you're going to do. Build skills that enable you to do the things that you say you want to do. Take care of yourself. You know, exercise, eat well, get sleep. Start there, and then you can start to expand out from yourself to those that are immediately around you and then go beyond and take it as far as you can. The reason I think that as a company we do well with that is that Matt has built a culture of us as a service company. That's our DNA, is that we serve others and So it's, I think, fortunate that we just culturally think that way, that everything we do is through the lens of service to others. And that's kind of, so by default, we're trying to add value to our clients. And same with sales. You know, sales gets the bad rap for always being this kind of pushy, manipulative thing. But I really like the concept of sales as a service. And it actually comes back to the same concept because. When I first started working on sales for TKC, I was very caught up in whether or not I would get the sale, quote unquote, close the deal, getting somebody to sign up for TKC. But as I studied sales more and have been doing it more, what I really want to accomplish in the purpose of a sales call is to help the other person make the best decision for them. And I see my job is more of a, I'm trying to serve this client, this potential client, in helping them determine whether this is a good fit or not as quickly as possible. And I'm confident about that process because I know what I'm offering has value. If it's not a good fit, I haven't, I've said this before to clients like, oh, okay, based on what it is that I'm hearing, I don't think this is the right solution for you. Right. And that's what I was saying about boundaries is 
when that's clear, you're not going to bend over backwards and basically lie to someone. Right. And then you won't be creating a relationship that's not built on trust. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that was a pretty long winded argument, but that... the steps were very clear <laughs> one through 37. <laughs> <laughs> Start with yourself and then build outward. That's the. That's do what the, you say you're going to do. The guy that wrote The Son of uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective Peoples, his son wrote a book about trust that was basically had that model of, it was, I think it's called The Speed of Trust. And basically that's high trust environments enable faster execution Absolutely. Um, you know, within an organization or what have you. That's also a common concept even within computer science and also business and macroeconomics. Countries, for example, that have low trust business culture or there, where there aren't good laws, for example, or well-enforced laws or good, you know, healthy kind of high trust business transactions have poor economic output. So it's a, it's a kind of a universal idea that has a lot of different um, ideas. But the first time that I'd heard of that starting with yourself and moving outward was in the speed of trust. I can't remember. It's by Covey, but not Stephen Covey. It's his son. But anyways, how about you? What would your steps be if you were to suggest somebody? They would be pick something to spend your time doing that keeps you curious. And then within that space, grow, expand your limits. Always be clear on what you can and can't do. And then I think the more curious you are, the less time it takes you to be unshakable. If you're not curious, it will take you a long time. Much better said than I did. Well, I had to listen to yours before I could regurgitate it in my own special way. I did a react video to what you just said. I like that. Awesome. Well, thanks for watching that Instagram video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You weren't supposed to say it was Instagram. Oh, sorry. I don't, things. I'm never on Instagram. Never. <laughs> <laughs> well, we hope you will take this learning and make yourself unshakable. And give us a review. Give us a share. We'll see you next week on Beast Over Burden. Thanks, Andrew. Bye-bye.